Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be May God's blessing be upon us. And may God protect us from the enemy who would try to steal this word from us. Amen. I realized at some point this week that this was the second church that I have served that sits in the middle of a cemetery, really. Um, now I know there's a road out front that separates us from the front cemetery, but I was looking at the, um, the drawings for the, for the new parking lot, and if you see it from the sky, this looks like a church that sits right in the middle of the cemetery. Um, a few years back, I served another church that was more literally in the middle of the cemetery. Um, you couldn't really tell the difference from the church and the cemetery at some point. It all kind of ran together. And I was thinking about some of the differences in, in the two churches. Um, we have a church, the church down in Bluffton called St. Luke's, um, a, a wonderful church with beautiful people in it, and um, I served there for four years, and Leah and I were married in that church. We, we, we loved the church. But I remember when I got there, they had a big black fence in front of it, and they had a little brown sign that had dead letters on it that told that this was St. Luke's United Methodist Church, and, and I believe that um, my name had, was hanging from the sign on a little chain, and there was probably the, the time of the service, I'm not exactly sure if that was true or not, because it was kind of a run-down sign. And then they had this big 4x8 piece of plywood sign, it was nicely done, it was big, much bigger than the church sign, and it said St. Luke Cemetery, and it said that there were cemetery plots for sale, which, which tells you something about a church when that happens, that they were more interested in selling cemetery plots than being a church at some level. At least on a, on a, on a basic level. And if, and if they weren't really more interested in that, at least that's what the world thought when they drove by. And I remember serving that, that church as, as its pastor. People would ask, well, where are, you, where are you the pastor? And where is that? And I would try to explain to them it was St. Luke's. And a lot of times they would say, wow, I didn't even know that church was still open and still operating. I thought it was kind of a historical place. There was a historical marker in front of it. It was just one of these nice places where he went and looked around and talked about the American Revolution and the Civil War. It was a church that sat in the middle of a cemetery. We couldn't, at, at that level, begin to distinguish that the church was a tombstone itself or a church. Then you walk by this church. One of the neat things about this is when I just said this is a church that sits in the middle of a cemetery, my guess is most of you never thought of it that way. Which is a good thing, even though we are surrounded by front and back by the cemetery. And I don't expect that when people drive by, they think about the church that's in the middle of the cemetery, and I don't think that they think at any level that this is a church that's not a church, it's a historical place. One of the things I, I love about this church just in driving by is that you can start to see the steeple and the cross and flame from, from different angles and different places rising above the tree rising above the cemetery. Yes, it's, it's not a sightly thing to drive by and see a, um, a metal fence out there, but you 
can just quickly see beyond that and see that there's something happening here. There's something rising up in the midst of all of this. Churches, churches um, oftentimes sit in the middle of cemeteries. And churches oftentimes in the, in the midst of sitting in the middle of a cemetery have to decide if they are a tombstone of things past or if they are a, a recognition that cemeteries that I talk with the children show us that the resurrection is real and, and, and amongst us and with us. Because there are two things that do happen in Christian cemeteries. There's the bodies of the faithful departed. There's a past and a memory in our cemeteries. And there is the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. <coughs> the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. Both of those things are found in our cemeteries. Now, when it comes to our churches, the one thing that's most important as we rise up and rise above that, when we recognize the resurrection, is that sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. Tombstones point to hope. Churches point to one thing, and one thing only, to the resurrection, to that which God is doing in our lives now and in the future. And I say that all in the context of the scripture lesson where Jesus is traveling with his disciples as he often is. And Jesus asks a question of his disciples. Who do they say that I am? You don't tell who they is. But what are they talking about out there? What are they saying about me? What are the crowd saying? Well, they say maybe um, you're John the Baptist. Or maybe you're Elijah. Or maybe you're one of the prophets. Maybe you're one of the ones that were here before and are no longer with us. Maybe you're one of those. Because people were beginning to recognize that Jesus was just a little bit different. And even if they didn't like him, they saw that he was powerful and was gaining a, 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 at least a crowd of people, a following. And they started to talk about him. He was beginning to have some press. One of my favorite passages of scripture comes in, in Luke's gospel. I don't know the exact scripture and verse. And it's in the King James where it says, And a fame went out about him. A fame. He was becoming famous. A fame, a report went out about Jesus to the point where he was becoming famous. So people were talking about him. Who is this Jesus guy? Well, I think mean, he's this kind of person or that kind of person. Certainly there was the negative thing starting to happen too. I think he's a revolutionary. I think he might be a terrorist. I think he might just be a rabble rouser, somebody who's just trying to cause trouble. They were talking about him. They were talking about him. Perhaps it's true the old adage is just this thing is bad press. That was true for Jesus as well. But he doesn't seem to be worried about what they're saying about him. He wants to know. He wants to know what they're saying about him. Who do they say that I am? I think it's a good question for the church to ask. I think really it is the church's question. I think in Matthew and telling us a story and giving us a story wants the church that's coming into being to ask that question. I think they want the church of today to ask that question. What are they saying about us? What are the people who drive by, the, the thousands of people who drive by, the, the hundreds and maybe thousands of people who will even drive by this morning, what are they saying about Red Bank United Methodist Church? What are they saying? Jesus cared enough to find out what people were saying about him. We should care enough to find out what people are saying about us. I don't know what they're saying about it, but we should, we should find that out. Because it's important. It's important to know. Now, I would expect they're saying, well, oh, that's that, that church that sits behind the cemetery with the big high steeple on it with the cross and flame. That's the church that um, um, has been here a long time and has been um, active in the community. That's the, the church that cares about missions. That's the church that has, has people who have been influential in this community for years upon years. As a church that used to be a small country mill church, but now it's this really big church, and things have changed there. All of those things are probably saying about us. I hope they're saying something about us. I hope they're talking about us. I hope that we're doing something influential and, 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 and important enough that somebody's driving by and talking about us to the point where one day they say, if I ever went to church, I'd like to try that place. Because I know there's some good folks there. 
because I've seen them out in public, and I've seen them out in, in the school, and I've seen them at the Walmart, and I've seen them at softball fields, and I've seen them in my civic organizations, and I've seen them in my workplace. I hope that's what they're saying about us. And if not, we can change what they're saying about us. We have some effect on what they're doing, as did the disciples. It helped people understand who Jesus was. And that's why Jesus' next question is really important. And he says, okay, I'm paraphrasing. He said, this is my paraphrase. He says, okay, that's who they say that I am. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Assuming this is that they were so close to him that they would have some kind of different knowledge about who Jesus was. They aren't just the ones passing by on the highway. They aren't just the ones who heard the story of the story. They're the ones who have been with Jesus. Who do you say that I am? And Simon's response is pretty clear. I'm going to make sure I get this right. You are the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the only one, the Son of the living God, the offspring, the incarnation. You are the Christ. You are the one we have been waiting for. You are the one that the prophets foretold. You are the one that we have been expecting. So I've been saying that, knowing full well what he's saying, knowing that, of course, that must be who he is because he laid down his whole life he gave up his livelihood as a fisherman to go and follow Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And again, I think that Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, was not just directed at his disciples 2,000 years ago. I think his question is for us today, for this church, for this body of people, for these disciples who have called and claimed Jesus as Lord and Savior. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? And your response, I hope, if not similar, if not the same, but if it's not the same as, I hope it's similar to Peter's. Who do you say that Jesus is? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of the living God. Jesus is the early incarnation. That's why we're here. If we're responding in a different way to who Jesus is, we're missing the point. If Jesus is just my friend, it's okay. Jesus will make a pretty good friend. If Jesus is just all right with you, that's okay. Jesus can handle it, but you're missing something. If Jesus is your pal, or, or, or your confidant, or I even saw a t-shirt one time that said, Jesus is my homeboy. If all Jesus is is your homeboy, that, that's okay. And Jesus is happy to have that kind of relationship with you. But he wants more from a relationship than just that. Jesus wants us to respond as did Peter because Peter represents us. Whenever you read about Peter in Scripture, it's, it's a true representation of who the church is because we are the church. We are the ones that the church is being built upon now. It's more than just that. We need to be able to respond. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. You are the incarnation. And not be so caught up with what the world is saying about us or what the world is telling us we should do and what we should be like. We should know what they're saying so we can respond properly to it. But the only way we can respond, respond properly and, and, and holy, in and, and a holy way is to respond with, we're here because we serve Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That's why we're here. That's what we're all about. And Jesus' response when Peter said that, Jesus' response when we say that is simple. You are blessed. Now the scripture says, blessed are you. But you are blessed. You are blessed in, in just having that knowledge. You have the blessing. But not just in having that knowledge, but being willing to give up your life as did Peter and to come and follow Jesus. You are blessed. And because of that blessing, you, Peter, and you, Red Man United Methodist Church, have been given something really important, something called authority. You have been given the authority. You have been given the keys of heaven, where death cannot stand against it. You have been given authority. One of, the, one of my favorite things in the ordination service, when I, and I hear it every year when I go to ordination annual conferences, that the, the new ministers, and I heard this from 17, 18, 
17, 18 years ago when I was fully ordained. Take thou the authority. Take thou the authority. As, as a Methodist preacher, I really liked hearing that. As an ordained minister, that was nice to hear. But as one who's a Methodist minister who also believes in the priesthood of all believers, who believe that you have been called to, to, to be in ministry and you have been called to a to serve in ministry to a, to, to a certain task for yourself, I also believe you need to hear that. Take down the authority. If you can respond to Jesus' question, who do you believe that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the incarnation, the one we've been waiting for. You're blessed. And you're blessed so much that you can take the authority that God has given you. You are blessed. And you have been given the authority to bind and to loose. To bind and to loose. Those are the words I've heard all my life. It's always one of those weird kind of church words, binding and loosing. Um, I, I never thought much about it in any other term except the scripture, to bind and to loose. And what you bind, and bind on earth will be bound for you in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed for you in heaven. Um, it doesn't even sound like it's all that important when you start to think about it. It sounds kind of, kind of silly. So I, this week I started to look more closely at that because, again, it's something I've heard and I've, I've kind of lived with and I've quoted before, binding and loosing. And I was trying to think about what it, what it might mean for us. And one of the things that came to mind, I started to think, if, if I'm not and if we're not as a church, I'm holding on to a lot of things, and particularly to some preconceived notions about way, the way things should be, the way things ought to be, the way things should work, the way things should operate. One of the, one of the things I always love with, with, with children, you hear this all the time, that's just not fair. That's just not fair. When, as you become an adult, as you've been a child, you realize, you know what? You're right. Things aren't fair. If, if they were fair, they always work out to my advantage. That's what, when we mean that's not fair, it means I don't like the way it's happening to me. That's not fair. Okay? If that's the case, certainly it's not fair. As we grow, we give up that preconceived notion that things are always fair, meaning that things are always going to work out the way we want them to for our own advantage. We, we give up on it. We let go of it. We lose it. To, to, get in, to get into heaven, I think one of the things we have to do is give up on that notion that things are always, that the things are always fair because we know they're not, but recognizing that they always work out for, to God's greater purpose. To let go of fair and hold on to God's greater purpose. To, to let go of fear, to lose the natural, to bind to ourselves that God's greater purpose is far more important than my own advantage. To let go of some things. To let go of things that say that I have a right to my anger. I have a right to my animosity. I have a right to sit here and tell you I'm right and you're wrong. To let go of some of these things. To let go of always needing to be right in every circumstance. To show off your talent and being able to, to, to um, be the smartest person in the room. I've said this before. I've actually said this to a good friend of mine um, um, and who, who's running for the Episcopal see? Um, I said the, 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 the biggest thing you'll have to be careful about is being the smartest person in the room. And he said, why is that? I said, because you know nobody likes the smartest person in the room. They don't do it. Sometimes they have to give up on that and let go of that. Because you've got to remember, especially when it comes to the church and the theology and what we believe, that it doesn't matter who the smartest person in the room is. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the room or I'm the smartest person in the room. The only thing that matters is if we're willing to follow Jesus, if we're willing to claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and to follow Jesus and to let go of some things that make us look powerful, that make us look important, that make us think that we're better than everybody else. They're saying some things about us out in the world. And some of the things they're saying are not right. And some of the things they're saying are derogatory and upset us and make us feel bad. They're happy because we've allowed ourselves to hold on to things that aren't important. To, to bind ourselves to the unimportant things and to not let go of them. And to not hold on wholly and tightly to what we truly believe. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. And really, what I think Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, to tell Peter, that it's time to let go. It's time to let go of what you think you're supposed to do. 
what you think is supposed to happen. And it's time to let God lead you where you need to go. It's time to let go and to let God. It's as simple as that. And in Matthew, there's something called the Messianic secret. You heard that in the scripture today in verse 20. It says that he charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. So they had to keep it a secret. That does not apply to him. That was for them and for that time. I don't believe that Jesus wants to keep, a, keep it a secret anymore. I think that was something for, for that moment. I think, in fact, he's crying out and saying, do not keep this a secret. Let everyone know what you know. Tell everyone what you already know, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in doing so, don't just say it, believe it. And if you believe it, you'll let go and you'll let God lead you. And when you let go, you're going to find out. You're going to be in for a heck of a ride. It's going to take you places you never expected to go. You're going to do things you never expected to do. You're going to do things that you said you would never do. And go places you said you would never go. I've had more people tell me when I ask them questions, I've asked them the question, well, have you ever thought about doing this? I would never do that. Have you ever thought about going into the ministry? Absolutely not. Have you ever thought about the Bible? I've asked a friend about myself. Have you ever thought about the Army chaplains? I would never go back into the Army. I did my time. I would never go back. He's serving now in Alaska as an Army chaplain. The other ones are serving as preachers. They're serving places in the church. When you let go, you end up places you never expected to be. But you end up where God wants you to be. And I believe that's not just true for individuals. I believe it's true for the church. When we're willing to let go and let God, we're going to go places we never expected. But we're going to end up exactly where God wants us to be. All because, when asked a question, who do you say that I am? We reply, you are the Christ. The Son of the living God, the incarnate one, the one we've been waiting for. And I want to do whatever it takes to follow you, including letting go of some things that make me look important. So that I can remember that all my only goal is to glorify you and further your kingdom. Let's let go. Let's let God. And let's enjoy this ride that we're about to go on. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is How Great Thou Art. Those singers, How Great I Art. How Great Thou Art. And as we sing this song, as we sing this great hymn, if you'd like to come forward for prayer, to rededicate your life, to um, make a confession of faith for the first time, to um, ask for prayer for yourself or for others, or for healing for yourself or for others, please feel free to do so. If you'd like for me to pray with you, as you come forward, just give me a sign. And if you'd like an anointing with oil for healing, you please touch your forehead. And I'll be humbled and honored to come and pray or to anoint you with oil. Let us stand and sing, I'll break that one. 